This viral YouTube video just explained life. And we're going to summarize it for you right now. Listen, I'm telling you guys, this video has almost 10 million views. And we're going to summarize it for you guys. If you don't have the 30 minutes to watch it, make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications. Check out Smala Sauce at SmalaSauce.com. Andrew, this is explaining game theory, the prisoner's dilemma, and should we cooperate or be selfish in this crazy life of ours. Yeah, and I, what I like about this video is that it's very applicable to kind of how people are feeling right now. Like, oh, is there a lack of cooperation in America right now? Why does it feel like maybe there's not a community, so not a lot of people are on the same page, people are feeling like it's a zero-sum game, they think that others, someone gaining, is taking from them immediately, but it's like, maybe that's not exactly how life works. Some aspects work like that, and sometimes it doesn't, and you should probably understand when it does and doesn't. I mean, long story short, prisoner dilemmas, Andrew, is like if me and you, we both get arrested for doing this crime, right? So if we, if we both don't snitch, we only do one year each, okay? If you snitch and I stay solid, I get three years, you get zero years because you get out, right? Mm -hmm. Also flipped around, and if we both snitch on each other, we both got to do two years. So it's almost like if two, you know how they always, in the cop movies, Andrew, they always try to get each other to snitch on each other? Right. So it's like basically like, what are people going to do? Are they going to snitch on their homie or are they going to stay solid for the mutual benefit? Or are, is basically one person going to go, you know what? I'm going to get off free and you're going to do all the years. Right. Yeah. This is a really good, interesting video that breaks it down in so many different ways. Um, so yeah, we're going to run through some of our favorite clips and then we'll give you our takeaways in some of the comment section. Obviously in the video, they're not sort of, uh, saying it and fr framing it in terms of negative terms, like people taking a, a confession or a plea bargain or snitching on somebody. Uh, but it is called prisoner's dilemma. Let's run the first clip. Some thought their best course of action was to launch an unprovoked nuclear strike against the Soviets while they were still ahead. In the words of Navy Secretary Matthews, to become aggressors for peace. Andrew, uh, this is uh, somewhat related to game theory, but it says that Americans oftentimes, Andrew, in the past, the government has said they have to, be, America has to be an aggressor to achieve peace. Mm. So basically what I'm saying is uh, I do think there's some legitimacy to this, but I'm not going to lie, Andrew. I think the American government uses this excuse too much. Right, right. I think maybe at a time it made more sense, but perhaps right now it makes sense that maybe America just becomes less aggressive, period, right? Yeah, it was crazy. I remember, Andrew, Obama got a Nobel Peace Prize, but I remember he had just ordered like a strike the, like the day before, so he had to say something similar. It's a very American saying. Anyway, let's move on to clip number two. This game is now known as the prisoner's dilemma. So let's play a game. A banker with a chest full of gold coins invites you and another player to play against each other. You each get two choices. You can cooperate or you can defect. If you both cooperate, you each get three coins. If one of you cooperates but the other defects, then the one who defected gets five coins and the other gets nothing. And if you both defect, then you each get a coin. The goal of the game is simple, to get as many coins as you can. All right, so this is explaining the prisoner's dilemma a little bit better than we did. Like we said, you can either cooperate or you can defect, but it's crazy because, Andrew, the selfish choice, if you want to stay out of trouble, is the choice that screws your friend. Right. So it's kind of weird. So, Andrew, are we in this point in late stage capitalism in America where people feel like that? Like in past times in America, did people feel like they were cooperating towards like, out of a pie, you get three, I get three. And now does it feel like you get five, I get zero, or I get five, you get zero? Yeah, yeah, it definitely feels like there's kind of this take, take, take mentality where it's like, hey guys, like together, if we cooperate, we can actually achieve an ideal situation for everybody. Because the, the pie has grown even though we split it in half. Right, right, but the attitude right now is kind of like, F everybody, it's all about me. Uh, I'll say this. America is not the worst country in the world with this attitude, but it feels like the, the cooperation is slipping a little bit. Obviously, Andrew, more cooperative societies off the top of my head, 
Japan, Scandinavia, even Canada, for example. I mean, listen, let's just take it into a dating aspect, man. Like, there's so much, like, dating conversation. I don't fully agree with all of it, but people are always like, oh, well, the man, like, whatever the man wants, or, like, girls want this, and this doesn't make sense, and then men want this, and the expectations don't work. And because between men and women, it kind of feels like a zero-sum game because at some point, you need cooperation between men and women so that there can be more men and women. So you're saying you're seeing this game theory play out even in the gender wars of the internet right now. Yes. Um, let's run the next clip. Suppose your opponent cooperates, then you could also cooperate and get three coins. Or you could defect and get five coins instead. So you are better off defecting. But what if your opponent defects instead? Well, you could cooperate and get no coins, or you could defect and at least get one coin. So no matter what your opponent does, your best option is always to defect. Now, if your opponent is also rational, they will reach the same conclusion and therefore also defect. As a result, when you both act rationally, you both end up in the suboptimal situation getting one coin each when you could have gotten three instead. It says when you both act rationally by being selfish, you end up with a suboptimal situation for both parties. Moving on to the next one. Both countries had nukes, neither could use them. And both countries spent around $10 trillion developing these weapons. Both would have been better off if they had cooperated and agreed not to develop this technology further. But since they both acted in their own best interest, they ended up in a situation where everyone was worse off. Andrew, this talks about the nuclear arms race during the Cold War between America and Russia. Andrew, they both spent the modern day equivalent of $10 trillion trying to build up more nuclear bombs than the other person. A lot of people are saying they could have spent that money internally to make their countries better for all their citizens. Right, right, right. Anyway, let's move on to point number three. So it's important for impalas to remove ticks, and they do this by grooming. But they can't reach all the spots on their bodies, and therefore they need another impala to groom them. Now, grooming someone else comes at a cost. It costs saliva, electrolytes, time and attention, all vital resources under the hot African sun, where a predator could strike at any moment. So for the other impala, it would be best not to pay this cost. But then again, it too will need help grooming. So all impalas face a choice. Should they groom each other or not? In other words, should they cooperate or defect? Well, if they only interact once, then the rational solution is always to defect. That other impala is never gonna help you, so why bother? The thing about a lot of problems is that they're not a single prisoner's dilemma. Impalas see each other day after day, and the same situation keeps happening over and over again. So that changes the problem. Because instead of playing the prisoner's dilemma just once, you're now playing it many, many times. And if I defect now, then my opponent will know that I defected, and they can use that against me in the future. Andrew, this is talking about the long-term impacts of cooperation with in a village. So basically, they're saying if people think they're going to see each other again, they're more likely to cooperate. But other times, if people feel like they're only going to see you once for the rest of their life, they might want to do something more selfish to you. Yeah, and I think this kind of goes back to how a lot of people feel like community is breaking down, where it feels like because communities have moved online, that it doesn't matter who you see on a day-to-day -day basis, who lives down the block from you. But at the end of the day, if you live in a building in New York City, if you live in the projects, if you just live in an apartment building, whatever it is, if you got neighbors close to you, at some level, you have to cooperate to live peacefully to each other. And it's even better if you work with each other. So for example, there's uh, bike lanes in the city, Andrew. Oftentimes they just they only go one direction, like 90% of them, right? But sometimes you see somebody speeding without lights coming down the wrong way. That person figures, I'm just trying to make my delivery. I'm trying to make my money. I'll never see you again. I don't care. Right. That person's not being cooperative. Right. Moving on to point number four. That is what Robert Axelrod, a political scientist, wanted to find out. So in 1980, he decided to hold a computer tournament. He invited some of the world's leading game theorists from many different subjects to submit computer programs that would play each other. Axelrod called these programs strategies. 
Each strategy would face off against every other strategy and against a copy of itself. And each matchup would go for 200 rounds. That's important, and we'll come back to it. Now, Axelrod used points instead of coins, but the payoffs were the same. The goal of the tournament was to win as many points as possible. In total, Axelrod received 14 strategies, and he added a 15th called Random, which just randomly cooperates or defects 50% of the time. All strategies were loaded onto a single computer, where they faced off against each other. One of the strategies was called Freedman. It starts off by cooperating, but if its opponent defects just once, it will keep defecting for the remainder of the game. After all the games were played, the results were tallied up and the leaderboard established. The crazy thing was that the simplest program ended up winning, a program that came to be called Tit for Tat. Tit for Tat starts by cooperating, and then it copies exactly what its opponent did in the last move. So it would follow cooperation with cooperation and defection with defection. But because Tit for Tat managed to cooperate with enough other strategies, it still won the tournament. So this guy, Andrew, he created a video game where basically people are able to submit different strategies into the game theory game to see who accumulates the most points. And guess what happened, Andrew? The Tit for Tat theory ended up winning. So basically, the game... Th theory philosophy or like the offensive scheme that won was one that's always cooperative but it just punishes the other side if the other side starts to be uncooperative mm. so basically and this is almost saying this is like having reserved good faith is basically over 200 reps the philosophy that won out the most right 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 i think this is this is one of the biggest takeaways from this video that you you got to watch it i mean watch our video first finish this video but then watch their video. Right, point number five. Axelrod found that all the best performing strategies, including tit for tat, shared four qualities. First, they were all nice, which just means they are not the first to defect. So tit for tat is a nice strategy. It can defect, but only in retaliation. The opposite of nice is nasty. That's a strategy that defects first. So joss is nasty. Out of the 15 strategies in the tournament, eight were nice and seven nasty. Second important quality was being forgiving. A forgiving strategy is one that can retaliate, but it doesn't hold a grudge. So tit for tat is a forgiving strategy. It retaliates when its opponent defects, but it doesn't let defections from before the last round influence its current decisions. Friedman, on the other hand, is maximally unforgiving. After the first defection, just from the opponent would defect for the rest of the game. Okay, that's it. No mercy. Andrew, it says that overall, nice games generally won more than nasty games. In terms of like nasty games being selfish, wanting to defect, wanting to trick people. Basically, people who were cooperative in good faith with other people who were cooperative in good faith, and sometimes they got burned by it, but in the long term of a life, they came out ahead. Wow, I think this is one of the... Being nice and forgiving, but not a pushover is one of the biggest takeaways from this video, man, honestly, right. because a lot of people, they, they think, don't they think you have to be one or the other. Yeah. They're like, dude, I just got to be an asshole because everybody else is an asshole. But it's like, or other people are like, yeah, I want to be nice because Disneyland is the world. Right, right, right. In both situations, uh, people will not want to be around you or they will take advantage of you. You know what? John M. Chu, famous director from Crazy Rich Asians and other movies, you know what? I remember he always told me, he goes, you know what makes me such an effective director? I'm always nice, but I know how to be an asshole to the asshole who's ruining the system. Mm. Moving on, point number six. Nice guys finished first. Now, tit for tat is quite forgiving, but it's possible to be even more forgiving. Axelrod's sample strategy only defects after its opponent defected twice in a row. It was tit for two tats. Now, that might sound overly generous, but when Axelrod ran the numbers, he found that if anyone had submitted the sample strategy, they would have won the tournament. Like we said, be nice and forgiving, and you sort of tailor based on who you're talking to if you give them one chance, two chances, three chances, or four chances, but it has to be variable on the situation based on the sort of the beast that you're dealing with. Ah, so not everybody deserves the same amount of chances, but probably everybody deserves some chance. Right. 
Well, this has to kind of goes back to like the prison system and like three strikes and you're out or how you prosecute. Cause like some people would say, Hey, some of these guys that out on bail reform, they got too many chances and now they're messing with people in real life and committing more crimes. And then there's on the other hand, there was cases where people didn't get enough chances. So somewhere in the middle, it might work. Right, right, right. But there's always room for human error, and that is the truth. Point number seven. After the second tournament, Axelrod identified the other qualities that distinguish the better performing strategies. The third is being retaliatory, which means if your opponent defects, strike back immediately. Don't be a pushover. I think that this point about you must have the ability to be retaliatory is key, especially for Asians in America, because so many people feel like Asians will not be retaliatory, even if people try to exploit or take advantage of Asians. Yeah, no, no. At, at some point, there is a point where you have to retaliate to show that you're not going to be a pushover. You want to be nice. You want to be nice. Okay, forgiving, forgiving. But at some point, you have to show people. Point number eight. The last quality that Axelrod identified is being clear. Programs that were too opaque that were too similar to a random program you couldn't figure them out because they were so complicated it was very hard to establish any pattern of trust with a program like that because you couldn't figure out what it was doing the, not you i mean the pro the other programs it was playing couldn't figure them out and so they would end up more or less defaulting to thinking every turn is like the last time i'm going to see you so i might as well defect what uh, to me is is mind-blowing about this is that these four principles, being nice, forgiving, provocable, and clear, is a lot like the morality that has evolved around the world that is often summarized as an eye for an eye. Uh, they said you have to be clear and consistent. Your strategy has to be something that is consistent. It can't just morph nonstop on the set. You can't switch up on one person. No, so you're saying like, I can't just be forgiving to these people and then... Uh, be less forgiving to these people and then more forgiving here. And then it's like, nobody knows. And are you, is Andrew going to be a nice guy and forgiving or is he just going to be an a-hole? Well, the laws have to be clear. Right. The laws have to be clear. But uh, th that's more on an infrastructure level. I think on an individual level, you can more tailor it. Moving on to point number nine. What's interesting is that while Tit for Two Tats would have won the first tournament, it only came 24th in the second tournament. This highlights an important fact. In the repeated prisoner's dilemma, there is no single best strategy. The strategy that performs best always depends on the other strategies it's interacting with. There's no best strategy. It's always within the context of the other strategies or rivals that you're playing against. Mm. Yeah, like we said, you gotta tailor your solutions. You can have a backbone, a spine, like a, a stick of bamboo, that's rooted in the ground, but you have to be able to be flexible given the situation to make the right, most accurate reads. Imagine a world that is a really nasty place to live, more or less populated with players that always defect. Except there's a little cluster of tit-for-tat players that live in some kind of nucleus. And they get to play with each other a lot because they're geographically um, sequestered. They will start building up a lot of points and also, because that translates into offspring, they'll start to take over the population. So, in fact, Axelrod showed that a little island of cooperation can emerge and uh, spread and eventually will take over the world. Andrew, this point number 10 said that if you are a group of tit-for-tat players, which is ultimately the best strategy, but you are in a room full of like 10,000 people who are bad actors, what you can do is group together and only do business with each other. Mm. And that is what a lot of communities do, you know, uh, because like a certain ethnic community, whether it's like a certain group of Chinese people or Jewish people that are known to work together tight, tightly, it's like you just know each other and you know each other's going to cooperate and you trust each mm. other is not going to do each other wrong or you're going to actually like... Hey, if I give you this, you're going to give me this. And I give this person oh, this. Like you're saying, you, you're familiar and you trust the consistency of each other's algorithms. Yes, yeah, so that's why it's very key that if trust breaks down in a community, then you almost cannot cooperate anymore. And if there's no cooperation, then almost everybody's just out for themselves. And if everybody's out for themselves, then ultimately it's going to be bad for everybody. Moving on to point number 11. What happens if there is a little bit of random error in the game? some noise in the system. 
For example, one player tries to cooperate, but it comes across as a defection. Little errors like this happen in the real world all the time. When Tit for Tat plays against itself in a noisy environment, both start off by cooperating. But if a single cooperation is perceived as a defection, then the other Tit for Tat retaliates and it sets off a chain of alternating retaliations. And if another cooperation is perceived as a defection, then the rest of the game is constant mutual defection. Well, you need a reliable way to break out of these echo effects. And one way to do this is by playing tit for tat, but with around 10% more forgiveness. So instead of retaliating after every defection, you only retaliate around nine out of every 10 times. This helps you break out of those echoes while still being retaliatory enough to not be taken advantage of. Boom, Andrew, now we're introducing some noise into the game, some chaos into the game. Because obviously when we're looking at the prisoner's dilemma, it's super simplistic, right? Oh, are you cooperating or are you defecting? But what if you choose either defect or cooperate, but somehow the signal gets crossed and the other person gets the wrong message. Ooh, well, I mean, I guess that's the error part, right? Maybe sometimes you think you're being kind, you think you're being nice, you think you're being forgiving, or you think you're being cooperative. Someone else doesn't exactly view it the same way, and then you feel like that person is not cooperating with you, mm. and then you're like, all right, F it, I'm done. I'm just out for myself, and then it ruins the system. Right, the mis mis <clears throat> uh, misinterpretation, miscommunication yep. turns into everybody defecting on each other, and then the whole system's gonna spiral down. What downwards. I really love is there's this quote in the comment section. I'm gonna bring it up now. Someone made a joke and said, wow, this confirms my favorite quote ever. Do unto others 20% better than you would expect them to do unto you to correct for subjective error. Meaning that like, you know, the old quote of the golden rule of do unto others, but you have to do a little bit better to others right. than you expect them to hit you back for just because you don't know you how mean, they'll perceive Cut them it. some additional slack, some uh, maybe one standard deviation of like misinterpretation, yeah. noise or chaos in the game theory lines of communication. Um, point number 12. While tit for tat or generous tit for tat doesn't always come out on top, Axelrod's main takeaways still hold. Be nice, forgiving, but don't be a pushover. Like we said, this just said, listen, you have to be sure to know that these strategies are never resulting in 100% wins. It's about winning over a large number, quantity of reps over a large volume of time. Yes. Like a life, not just like one instance. Exactly, exactly. Again, uh, this is, is, it's like if you know you're only gonna meet someone once, and you can get away with swindling them, with stealing from them, or taking slight advantage from them, a lot of people are naturally going to do that. But if you know you're going to see someone again, and you're going to have to interact with each other in this community, in this world, in this lifetime, then you can't do that. Right? Which brings us to point number 13. One of the main things that sets life apart from non-living things is that life gets to make decisions. We get to make choices. Choices that don't only change our future, but also the future of those we interact with. Andrew, he said it right there. What sets us apart from non-living things is that we can make decisions that shape the world. Right. And I think, what does he mean by non-living things? Like human beings and animals, we're different than like a amoeba... Mm -hmm organism like a virus is an organism that just looks out for the virus right so it's going to latch onto whatever it can to grow right but then the virus <clears throat> often kills the animal and then the whole virus dies once the animal dies right right so, so like we said a virus he just being a scorpion on a frog's back um anyway to sum it up andrew what do you think it is is it basically saying be nice judge whether people deserve one two three four maybe some people you love them so much they could fix themselves. You give them five chances, but you still need to have your boundaries and you need to be retaliatory when people violate the boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, to sum it up, I mean, I think there's a main, couple main points. One, cooperation, even between rivals, <clears throat> oftentimes breeds the best results. Life is not a zero-sum game because games like a basketball game is a zero-sum game. Somebody has to win or lose. But in life, that's not necessarily the case. Everybody can win. 
be nice, be kind, but not a pushover. And remember, in the short term, the environment shapes the individual. But if there's enough cooperation amongst the individuals, then they change the environment. Right. Um, let's just get into the comment section real quick. Somebody said you can act in reserve good faith, but you got to try to push them and punish them into cooperating again. I mean, that's what laws are generally designed to do, right? Somebody said, I believe that humanity has got to where it's gotten through cooperation, not aggression. And then somebody said, well, it's actually both cooperation and aggression. For example, Europeans colonized and committed genocide on the native population and on America, but that provided the industrial revolution that provided us with the comforts of the modern era. It's all a paradox. Yeah, right. that's a very intellectual, that's a very deep comment. Some people said, adding this to my list of the best YouTube videos of all time, I would say, Andrew, the history of the world is also another good one. Yeah. What, what else you like? I mean, Ray Dalio's Changing the World Order. Yeah, any video that generally has like 10 million views that had a lot of money put into it, generally is a Dude, good video. this is why YouTube's the best, man. YouTube is the best digital media platform, period. The information is unmatched. Um, some people were talking about the more nuances because basically this initial video, Andrew, it's 30 minutes long. It can't cover all the nuances of um, sort of proportional response, symmetry of consequences, Nash equilibrium. There's not just prisoners develop dilemma. There's survivor's dilemma. Um, some people are talking about oligopoly, you know, which is like markets with like extra large players. So yes, there is more detailed things to, you're not just going to watch one video and understand all the nuances of like a Harvard MBA game theory, you know, 10 classes. But basically what I'm saying is this is a generally a pretty good theory, Andrew, but then you got to make your adjustments based on the details of your real life on top of this. Yeah, man. I just thought of something, you know, the date whole David Chang, Momo Fuku trying to trademark chili crunch thing. That was all relatable to this. He David, ruined the cooperation. David Chang and Momofuku at that time, which they pulled back from, but they were trying to trademark something and they were breaking the code of cooperation. They were defecting. They were just looking out for themselves and trying to trademark the word nope. chili crunch. They were trying to get five and make sure the other person got zero. But what ended up happening is the backlash from the customers and the people and everybody else didn't like it. So now it ended up hurting Momofuku's business, ended up making David Chang look kind of bad. And now they're not going to enforce the Chili Crunch trademark. Right. So. I think that there's so many implications from this video. A lot of people were talking about how like good neighborhoods operate versus bad neighborhoods. So that, because there's so much chaos and noise and people feel like they're never going to see anybody ever again. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like have, uh, you know, sometimes it drives on a probability basis, more short term thinking and things like that. And just ultimately, guys, I think that having reserve good faith, but you need to have the ability and, and want to punish people that violate your, your boundaries. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, guys, you getting three, Andrew, me getting three, instead of one of us getting five and the other person getting zero is ultimately a better way to grow civilization. Mm -hmm. Anyway, guys, let us know what you think of this video in the comment section below. Is America crumbling? Are we getting away from the cooperation? Are too many people being selfish and defecting? And that's causing this whole downward spiral of everybody defecting. Uh, what do you guys think? of this theory. What do you guys think of this video? Watch the whole thing in the comment section below. That was our summary. Until next time, we the Hop Hop Boys. We out. Peace.